This morning, um, I want to launch right in, and we're going to, we're going to get to our scripture uh, in just a minute. I want to set the stage, but before we do, let's pray together. Lord, I am so grateful for this opportunity to share your word this morning with the church. And your word says a lot about who we are to be and who we are to become, how we are to go about being the body of Christ. Sometimes we get that right, and sometimes we don't. But we yield ourselves to you at this moment, that your spirit would come upon us, that it would translate truth in a way that is deeply personal and yet corporately transforming. We thank you for your grace that goes before us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. As you know, there was once a day when everyone thought the world was flat. There were stories about people who had fallen off the face of the earth, and those stories were told over and over again. But we know that the world actually is not flat, even though it does look that way in western Kansas. (laughs) I just got back from the hiking trip, and that stretch in western Kansas through eastern Colorado really would lead one to believe that the world is indeed flat. What a wonderful, featureless environment that is. (laughs) There was once a time when everyone believed that the Earth was the center of our solar system, in fact, the center of our galaxy. We believe that the sun rotated around the earth because that's just the way it looked to us. And that made us feel like we were pretty special. I mean, we were really the thing that God created us. And then all the stars and and the planets and the, the moon, those were decorations for us. And then one day we discovered, actually, that's not true. We're really, 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 really small. And the sun is really, really, really big, and and we orbit around the sun. And then the sun is only one tiny star amidst billions of them within our galaxy. And our galaxy is only one within billions of galaxies within our universe. And it changed the way that we thought about ourselves. Because truth has that way of changing the way that we think about ourselves. So this morning, I'm starting a four-part series called Dispelling the Myth, because I think just as, as, as it was a myth that the world was flat, and it was a myth that we were the center of the universe, there exists within many, many local churches a number of myths, and these myths can be destructive. They, they can hamper our effectiveness at being faithful to what God has called us to do. And so this series is unapologetically addressed towards the church in a a hope that in so doing that we we will grow in our ability to become the church that God has called us to be and, and, uh, and the truth will set us free. That's what I hope. Either that or it could get me in trouble. So we'll see because it's uncomfortable talking about some of these things. But let's do it, let's just jump right in. What's myth number one? You read it in your bulletin. It's a myth. The church is like a country club. You wanna see me just come all undone? Tell me that the church is like a country club. You know what the real myth here is? And this is where it gets offensive. Hold on to yourselves, here we go. That The church exists to accommodate the preferences of its membership. That's really the myth, because that's what a country club is like. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't shut down yet, because what I did not say is that the church uh, doesn't care about your needs. Obviously, the church cares deeply about the needs of the members. In Romans 12, Paul says that as the body of Christ, we belong to one another, In his writings, he says, when when one suffers, we all suffer. When one celebrates, we all celebrate. I don't know if you've realized it, but this has been a very difficult summer in the life of our church in terms of health and death. It's really been uh, just one after another. 
We have families in our church who are going through very difficult times. And it's warmed my heart to see the way that Colonial, in terms of its, its lay people, its ministry teams and staff, have reached out and cared for these people who have experienced tremendous loss and difficulty. The way we care for one another honors God. It's a big deal. And we take that very seriously here. The myth is not that we don't care about the needs of our members. The myth is that we exist to accommodate the preferences of our membership. What does that mean? Well, if I were to take a survey of all of the members of Colonial, and I were to ask you a number of questions like, how do you prefer your music? What volume do you like it? What style do you like? What do you think the people on stage should be wearing when they stand up here? How do you like uh, the, the, the hours of the service, and, and what do you think about um, how long the pastor preaches? I'm never going to ask you that. <laughs> but if I took that survey and that opinion poll, I would learn all about your preferences. And learning all about your preferences would then might compel me to try to accommodate all of your preferences. And of course, your preferences would be so varied and so diverse that I would drive myself literally insane trying to accommodate all the preferences of the membership. But you know what? That's, that's what country clubs kind of do. Uh, the country club mentality is that our membership equals privilege and, and status and entitlement to some degree. I'm a member. I've been amazed at how many times when people introduce themselves, they say, I'm so-and-so, and I've been a member here for 30 years. I'm so-and-so, and we've been members here 15 years. We're so-and-so, we've been members 50 years. And that's a, that's a good thing for me to know, and I appreciate that. But what does that mean? Because in a country club, membership means privilege and entitlement. And if we want things the way we want them, because it is our personal preferences, and we expect that the leadership of the organization is going to accommodate our preferences, then the metaphor of the church will look like a country club or maybe even a cruise ship. How many of you have ever been on a cruise? You make me sick. <laughs> I've never actually been on a cruise, but I've, I watched the love boat Oh, Captain Steubing and Gopher. I mean, I get, I get the cruise ship. And the cruise ship is a great thing if you're on vacation. But if you have the mentality of this is a cruise ship, then this is some of the expectations you might have when you walk into the local church. The church exists to entertain you to some degree, inform you, make you feel good and relaxed, serve you, care for your needs, provide fun programs for the kids, and lots of opportunities for socializing. Now, that may seem kind of weird or absurd to some of you, but think about it. How many people will tell you that they came to a church or left a church based upon the services the church provided or failed to provide for them and their family? How often do we hear people say, we're presently church shopping? Consumer language, cruise ship language. People will, will determine the success of a particular program or a, or a sermon or music or whatnot by language such as, that, that really fed me, or I, that didn't, I didn't really get fed by that. This is the language of consumerism and the same kind of criticisms or, or critique that you would have of the cruise that you just took. Now, if I'm the captain of a cruise ship, I want to know what your preferences are so that I can best accommodate you. Your accommodation is my number one priority so that you will cruise with us again and tell all your friends about how much you enjoyed our ship and, and hopefully you will come back and they will come back and that'll bring more money into our ship and so we can provide more and more services for our customers. Is this a cruise ship? I don't know. You know, many churches operate in this fashion. 
We want to accommodate the needs of our members so that they'll be happy. So we, we take an opinion poll and see how we're doing in accommodating their preferences. The programming, staffing, and leadership of these churches are based on the public opinion poll. This tendency would be common in country clubs, private high-class neighborhood associations, and other such organizations. But here is the myth. Dispelled. The church does not exist to accommodate the preferences of its members. That is a fallacy that we must fight against. So, what does the church exist to do? Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. There's a lot written on the church, and most of it is in Acts. But I like to start a little earlier than that. When Christ called 12 people together and said, follow me, because at the end of the day, what is the church? The church is comprised of people who call themselves followers of Christ. And so consequently, here's what the church, essentially in a nutshell, two simple verses, is about. At at its heart. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. simple. We are called, we are equipped, and we are sent. This is the body of Christ. This is the local church. Notice that Christ uh, doesn't ask his disciples where they might like to travel or how they prefer to travel or who they like to associate with when they're on their travels. He just calls them together He gives them power and authority, gives them explicit directions, and he says, go. This is what I want you to do. We are a missional organization. The local church exists to faithfully love and serve Christ who is the head of the church and to obey his command to tell all the world about him, teaching the truth and leading people to become Christ followers. We have been called, as you continue to look into the scriptures, to care for the poor, Feed the hungry, visit those who are sick or in prison, and love one another as God loves us. We have marching orders. We have a life-saving mission. So the metaphor of a country club or a cruise ship is completely inappropriate. Do you see it? Now, we need a metaphor, most of us. We live in the metaphors. That's just the way that we do. I once was at a leadership conference, and they said, what is your life metaphor? I mean, I think it's important, and we use metaphors. Jesus used them all the time in terms of parables and similes and metaphors, imagery that helps us to imagine what we are or what we are to become. And and in the Bible, metaphors for the church are the body, like a a human body, right? Uh, Paul uh, tells Timothy to be a good soldier of Christ. The idea of, of military language is there. Um, we, we know that we're dumb sheep of, of a flock, right? And Christ is our good shepherd, and, and we need to listen to the voice of our shepherd. Jesus used, and Paul used metaphors that people could relate with every day. And since I come from the coast and have salt water in my veins, I'm going to lay a metaphor on you. If the church needs one, try this one on for size. The church is God's Coast Guard cutter. I just love it. Think about it. A Coast Guard cutter is smaller than a cruise ship. It's designed for speed, high seas, and combat when necessary. The crew on the cutter consists of trained, equipped, focused sailors who understand their mission and carry out their responsibilities with great care and excellence. The captain of the cutter has the responsibility of leading the ship out to sea precisely into the worst storms because that is where the need is the greatest. He doesn't send out opinion polls amongst his crew because his mission is not to accommodate the preferences of the crew. The captain and the crew understand what their mission is, to go out there and save lives, to steam straight into the highest waters in order to help those who are lost and going down. I love it. It motivates me because when I think about the local church, I don't think about a bunch of people who come together to have their preferences accommodated, to feel good and, 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 and to go through the motions of doing church. I think of the church 
as a life-saving organization. We have been given power and authority from God to go out there and bring healing and transformation in the name of Christ. We were never meant to be a country club. Now, when Christ called his disciples and sent them out, we learn a lot about what it means to be the church. And as we go into the rest of the scriptures, you'll find case after case after case of where Christ speaks to his disciples, he speaks to his church then and now in the language not of an accommodator, but as an admiral. L listen to just a few uh, of these lines. Luke 10, 3, now go. I'm sending you out like lambs among the wolves. John 15, 20, they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Luke 9, 23, if you're going to follow me, you will have to daily carry a cross, i.e., it may cost you your life. Matthew 10, 39, those who lose their life for my sake will find it. And then the marching orders, once again, Matthew 28, so go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them to obey what I have commanded, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is not country club language. This is not cruise ship language. This is the language of an admiral sending out his troops, of a captain calling his crew together and saying, we're heading out to sea, and it matters. It matters what you do. We have been called, equipped, and sent. Our calling comes right from the beginning of time. When God predetermines, as we talked about in our last series, when he chooses to be God in relationship to us and takes on Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, and, and says, I'm going to love you no matter what. I'm going to die for you, that you may die to yourself and become one with me and be reconciled. Our call is all over the scriptures. But at some point, that dying to self, because of our call, requires us to give something up. Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I have been crucified with Christ. What does he mean, I have been crucified? Ego, I, my preferences, that which I think is most important, even my self-preservation and my maximum satisfaction, I yield to the mission of what God has called me to do. We have been called and then we are equipped. Jesus doesn't send us out on our own power and our own intelligence. He says in John 14, as he's about to leave the, his disciples in terms of his physical presence, he said, I will send to you as believers the Holy Spirit, the counselor, the spirit of truth, and he will come upon you in such a way that you will be able to accomplish more than I have in my earthly ministry. We are given spiritual gifts. We're provided with God's word for instruction. We're surrounded by others who help us to develop these gifts and overcome our weaknesses. That's where the strength of the community is. Much of what we do within the church every Sunday, every week with Bible studies and small groups, much of that is designed to equip you, to instruct you, to give you the tools that you need. But equipping you is not an end unto itself because the story doesn't end there. With our calling and our equipping, we are people who have been sent. He sends his followers, those within the church, to go. We have been called and equipped that we will go where Christ wants us to go. And here's the deal, church, don't miss this. Christ will always send us out right into the middle of the storms of this world. He, he's not going to send us into the harbor. He's going to send us right into the storm. The church is a missional organization. We have a job to do, and it's incumbent upon us to mobilize, structure, staff, train, equip, pray, and obey God's call to go out there and save lives, to go out there and risk it all for those ships that are going down. Go out there and tell them and show them and love them and lead them to a place of hope and transformation, community, all that God has planned for the great world out there. And for whatever reason, he chose to accomplish that plan through us. There is no plan B. So this church is not a country club. This is not a cruise ship. 
and we will not make decisions based upon the preferences of our members. That would be death to this church. We will make decisions upon what helps us best to accomplish our mission as handed down to us from our admiral, from our captain in chief, from the lamb who was slain, that we may have life and live it for him. Brothers and sisters, don't believe the lie. Your membership here is not a license for entitlement. You have been saved and called for the high seas. Your life, your gifts, your passions, your intelligence, your participation are all means by which we as the body of Christ mobilize to advance the kingdom of God. Ships are going down. Lives are at stake. Millions have lost their way. Just this week, I've heard about the fact that 27 million children live in poverty. Millions and millions will die from starvation. Even within our own country, 20,000 families still living in, in these mobile homes three years after a storm without any safe and permanent housing just down the street from where we live. Who's going to do something about that? Christ said, I am. What's your plan, Christ? What's your plan for showing how good and how powerful you are to the world? Well, it's called the church. We are one ship in God's Coast Guard cutter. And this ship is getting ready to steam straight into the storm. There are other ships. We're not alone, and we need to pray for them and their mission. But God has called me to skipper this ship called Colonial. And every one of you, every one of you who is a believer, from the youngest to the oldest, is a vital, essential member of the crew. And so as your lead pastor slash skipper, I need to know that you get this that you understand the nature of our church and that you are committed to our mission. I need for you to understand that the officers of this ship have already and will continue to make some very tough decisions that may not gel with your personal preferences. That is not a lack of love or respect for you no matter how long you've been a member of this church. We take our orders from the admiral. And that is where we must make decisions. We cannot put a battle plan together by polling the personal preferences of the crew. And I know that you understand that. I need for you to understand that we have been called to point the bow of this ship straight into the wind and do whatever is necessary to advance the kingdom of God into the storms of this world. You need to know now that the waves will get high. Some of you will turn green. I may turn green from time to time. Ginger tablets are helpful with that. But don't be surprised when the waves get high. It would be like a soldier who just went through six months of basic training, steps onto the battlefield, say, oh, they're shooting at us. What did you think? What did you expect? The body of Christ does not exist to play it safe. By definition, we carry a cross. And we risk ourselves for the sake of the mission because that is what we've been called to do and empowered to do and given authority to do. Remember what the captain says? If they can't get to us, we're going to get to them. And the first mate stands next to him and says, but captain, going broadside? It's too high. It's too dangerous. We can't handle that. You know what broadside means? It means when you turn your ship from going straight into the waves, make that turn, and it, when you do that, you stand to be capsized. This, this actually happened. Did you know that? This, this clip came from the perfect storm. That's an actual historical event. It was one of the greatest meteor meteorological uh, occurrences that have ever happened in history that we know of over 100 foot waves, and this Coast Guard cutter did actually go straight out into that to try to save and rescue those ships that were going down. 
We will go broadside at some point. We must. Because allowing people within our community, allowing people within our world simply to go down is not an option. Protecting our boat is never the mission. It'd be nice, but sometimes the mission calls for us to go broadside, to risk it. And along the way, we will get uncomfortable and we may experience profound failure, but we just need to trust that God goes before us. He has given us power and authority to go out and to bring healing and hope and transformation, but we're not going to do it sitting in the harbor. So the world is not round. I'm sorry, the world is not flat. It's round. The sun is the center of our galaxy, not the earth. And the church is not a country club or a cruise ship. We've been called, equipped, and sent. We're missional. And we're ready to leave the harbor and head out to sea. It's going to be a great adventure. It's scary at times. But we have a great commanding officer. And I'm not talking about me. Our admiral is Lord of the sea. He is king of kings. He is the great I am. He is competent of leading this ship and accomplishing this mission. He's competent and capable of saving them like he saved us. So my friends, my brothers and sisters in faith here at Colonial, first let me tell you this, I count it a great honor to go to sea with you. And secondly, listen for the admiral's voice because this ship is fixing to sail. Let's pray together. Lord, you've called us You've equipped us, and you have sent us. Let us never lose sight of the mission of what you've called us to do. Let us never back down from that, no matter what the cost. Help us to overcome our selfishness. Help us to overcome our discomfort. When our preferences are not met and accommodated, help us to know that we have been crucified in Christ. And it's no longer I who live, but but Christ who lives in, in me and in each one of us who are believers. We just pray that we would be found faithful when it's all said and done. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen.